If you change your mind, you change your life, just change your mind. The Lord loves you. He's standing with his arms wide open for you. Oh, be encouraged, cause this day's for you. Don't you let this opportunity pass by you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Change your mind. You heard the music. That's what we're here about. We believe that if you change your mind, you can change your life. People sometimes ask me, like, where did you get that name from? Listen, for those of you who don't know, the name of our ministry comes from the definition of repent. We believe in repentance. We believe in the opportunity to receive new information, to be taught new information so we can make better decisions. That's at the heart of what we do here in this ministry. We teach you. And yes, the teaching can be confrontational. It should be confrontational uh, if it hits up against some bad information on the inside of you. You want it to be confrontational. And it puts you in a place where you got to make a decision. And so tonight, teaching again. We teach on Sundays. We teach on Wednesday because we want clarity to give you, the, give you the information so you can make a decision about your life and how you will make decisions going forward. Change your mind. You can change your life. Come on, pray with me. God, we are here because we do want our minds to be changed. You said that we should push toward the renewing of our mind. We are here. We are here hoping to be conformed, to be transformed, to have our eyes open, revelation given to us to make us understand life, ourselves, and you even more so, so that we can make the right choices that reflect your glory and allow us to live a life that you died for. Holy Spirit. Let's teach tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Y'all know for the last several weeks, we've been in a series uh, near and dear to my heart. Who am I? Who am I revisited? And um, it's where we, we are obsessing over righteousness. Righteousness means to be who you ought to be. And so we have another installment in that series. And this one was entitled, The Old Me Was Scared but not this version. The old me was scared, but not this version. And we came from 1 John, the fourth chapter, the 18th verse, and it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. 1 John 4, 18. The old me was scared, but not this person. And again, we are obsessing as we close out this year with the need, the need to really know who we are. Listen, the more and more I study this, and I've always been been fascinated with righteousness, but 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 I feel like it's absolutely critical right now for where we are. And it's going, to, it, it's going to enable us to come out of this pandemic, come out of this low season. And this pandemic has not only made us fearful of COVID, this pandemic in many ways has made us fearful of each other, fearful of relationships, fearful of moving forward. All types of fear <laughs> is in the atmosphere right now. And we have to overcome that thing. And what I want to show you tonight, what I attempted to do on Sunday and will further attempt to do tonight is to show you that take this thing to heart and, and you'll begin to put fear back in its place. As scripture, as scripture just says, there is no fear in love and a perfect love cast out fear. And so the more I study righteousness, the more I'm beginning to believe and see that righteousness is the key to the believer. You got to be a believer to really have this because when you confess the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 10 and 9, it, it says in that in that scripture that you become righteous. You be, you're dropped off in the vein or the process of becoming righteous. So you can't have this outside of salvation. So this really speaks to the believer, those who are saved. Now, if you're watching tonight and you're not saved, you will be able to understand what I'm talking about. You just won't be able to benefit from it. But I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of this to give your life to Christ. And I hope you will. But until then, Pay attention because I want you to see how much the Bible makes sense. 
it, it, it combines the spiritual and the practical together. There is no disconnect. There is no disconnect between the spiritual and the practical. The spiritual gives birth to the practical or what you see out here. Spiritual does not mean cast for the ghost and all these spooky little things. Spiritual, Jesus said, they are words and thoughts. Uh, my words and my words and my thoughts are spirit, he said. So words and thoughts uh, uh, make up the spiritual world, which the spiritual world then makes up the tangible world we see. Whatever you think about, whatever you talk about, whatever you're consumed about, that will result in your behavior, that will result in what you believe, that will result in what you do. We wouldn't have this chair, this computer, this all the stuff that we're using right now had not somebody began to entertain this in their thoughts. And so it was first created on the inside of a person. And then they began to reconstruct their lives in a way that allowed them to produce what they saw on the inside and produce it on the outside. That's not just with these tangible things we see. That's with your quality of life. So again, if you change your mind, you change your life. And the starting point I want to give you is that once you're saved, You have to become obsessed with knowing who, finding out who God intended you to be in the beginning. He sent you here intentionally. You're not an accident. I don't care about the circumstances surrounding your birth. Circumstances surrounding your birth created a body. The circumstances surrounding your birth decided what you look like on the outside. You look like a combination of the two families that you came from. But the person that was deposited inside that body, fully God's decision. So who you are on the inside is a divine decision. Divine decision. I hope you believe that. I hope you receive that. You're way beyond an accident. You are an intentional uh, act of God. And see, now, since I, if you believe that you are an act of God and it was intentional, I need to find out why he decided to send me when he sent me. Why did he decide to send me to what family that he sent me? Why did he decide to put me in whatever gender I'm in, whatever race I'm in? All of that has intentionality behind it. So if you, if you hear all of that, and if you can tap into your righteousness, you'll start making sense of your life. And so that's what I'm here to help you do tonight. If I can just hear who God wants me to be and make that an obsession in my life where I began to redirect my energies and readjust all types of things in my life, then I will be in good standing with God. Most people, when you ask them what righteousness means, they'll say to be in good standing with God. I take it further. How do you become in good standing with God? By being who he wants me to be. I want you to understand that. All right. So listen, I'm not gonna keep you here long tonight. So in 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 Sunday's message, I wanted to talk about these two things that distinguish the believer uh, from the rest of the world. But also, it's, I want you to see how these two things work together. Let me back up. There's two things that you need to know about, understand, work with that set you apart, distinguish you. God's mission in saving you was to set you apart, to distinguish you. Why? Because by doing that, he satisfies a need or needs that we all have. I don't care how hard you try to suppress that thing. All of us have a need to to be significant. All of us have a need to, to make sure that I matter as a person, my life, my contributions, they matter. And if we don't find the appropriate way to satisfy that itch, satisfy that need, We'll be drawn in all types of behavior uh, that leaves us further confused because we're trying to come up with some way to matter to somebody or to some somebody's. And so we can do a whole bunch of unhealthy things. And so when God comes in our lives, he's trying to heal us from those decisions that we made trying to matter. You feel me? All those decisions that you made trying to be significant, trying to be important to somebody. Left you wounded, broken, because it put you in positions that you should have never been in put you in positions that were over your head, put you in relationships that left you damaged. And so God is saying, I I can give you what you've been looking for. And if that's the case, it also means this. 
that your desire to matter is not wrong. Because here's one thing we'll do. Uh, when we fail to satisfy something properly, we'll tell ourselves, well, maybe that need is not holy. That need is not what God wants me to have. And so we'll try to suppress the need to matter. And it's impossible to do it. It is a divine thing because you made in the image of God. And so you're supposed to be significant. You're supposed to be significant. So much so he calls you little G gods. So much so that scripture says you made that you were made just a little bit lower than him. You cannot be made just a little bit lower than him and above the angels and not be significant. You just have to tap into that thing that makes you a contributor. That makes you a giver in society. That's really what you're trying to get a hold to. Am I making sense? If I am, put it in the chat that it makes sense, Pastor. That makes a lot of sense because I do want to be significant. I do need to matter. I do need to make sure that my time spent in the earth uh, was worth more than just me. Worth it was worth to, it was worth something to other people as well. All right. So there's these two things that that I need you to know that you have to master in your understanding, but you also have to master in your demonstrations. Not enough to know it, you got to show it. And these are the two things of love and righteousness. And I want to show you how these two things work in tandem to set you apart, to make sure you matter. But listen, also to make sure that God can use you. And as I said Sunday, if you can live in a way that God can use you, that forces God's hand a little bit. Because in order to use you, he also has to bless you. And may, every one of us want to be blessed. Every one of us want to experience the love of God, experience the provisions of God, uh, to be used in a mighty way by God. We do. So we can throw that false humility out the window. But to be able to do that, I have to live in a way that makes me usable. And how do I do that? Love and righteousness. If you're hearing me, we're about to change the game. About to change the game for your life. If I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you these two things, not 12, 24, 100 things to master. Right now, we just talk about these two things. What God views as love and what God views as righteousness. And if you combine those, it makes me usable and makes me a prime candidate for God to bless me. All right. So let's delve into this a little bit. Paul told us, let's start off with love. Let's recap love. Paul told us how incredible, import, incredibly important love was. He told us in 1 Corinthians 13 and 13. Um, but now faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. He said faith exists. Hope exists. Love does exist. They abide there. They are real things, real things in the world. And the greatest of these is this thing called love. And when it's referring to love being the greatest, I want to make sure we understand what that means. Love being the greatest, that word can be translated also as the elder or the leader. Here's what you got to know about that. Faith is wonderful and needed. Got to have it. Hope is wonderful and needed. But get this. Love out of those three have to lead. And when I say lead... Love has to be the primary thing that we filter our decisions and our actions through. Or in other words, is what I'm doing or what I'm about to say, does that reflect this kind of love? Does that make sense to you? Because when you get good at that, and you can, and even as I'm talking, you can imagine, man, it's going to take some practice because, you know, it's not every other thing. It's, it's not every now and then. Now and then filter something through love. No, my life's decisions should first stop at love and go, does this reflect love? Does this post tweet reflect love? Does my tone reflect love? Does my behavior, my mood reflect love? That's going to take some time. But if you focus on that and you realize it's of grave importance to you and it's grave important in terms of God being able to use you, you will make it a priority. And it's like any other muscle. You work at it long enough, that muscle gets strong. This can get strong, too. And your mastery of this 
sets you apart, makes you stick out, make, makes um, makes you appear different, makes you uh, look usable and sought after those things that we quietly desire in life. Because again, woven somewhere in our God-given DNA is that we know we were sent here with intentionality. And we're supposed to be here helping people and solving problems for people. And so if you do that, you can't be a light hidden under a bushel. You can't be someone stuck in the corner, stuck in the background. And see, once you become crystal clear on what you're capable of and the fact that you know that God partners with you, you stop wanting to hide. You don't have to be braggadocious. You don't have to be cocky, but you refuse to be hidden. You want it to be known what you're good at because you're looking forward to being a blessing to other people. Hope that makes sense. And again, it distinguishes us because John said this, John 13 and 35. You know this text, I'm sure it says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, they will know that you belong to me, that you won't look like everybody else based on your consistent demonstration of love. That thing sets you apart. All right. So I know you understand what I'm saying cerebrally, mentally, logically. But it ought to beg the next question. And the next question ought to be, how do I do that? What's the best way for me to stay in a mindset of love when I'm interacting with people? And the best way to do that is that I'm always presenting the best version of myself. What is the best version of you. Here we are, right back at righteousness. The best version of you is not to continue to be the person you've been and the person you made. And most of the first people that we made was in response to trying to meet the needs and preferences of all of these different people whose paths we crossed in our lifetime. And when you when you're stuck in this this mode of people pleasing and trying to meet the preferences of people, you realize how badly that can jack you up because people change their preferences on a dime. The moment you think you've mastered being who somebody wants you to be. They change. And here's the reality. Let's not make that a negative thing because to live in this earth and to be a human being, you should be constantly changing because you should be constantly growing. And so your preferences, listen, it's not, it's not a bad thing. Your preferences ought to be changing as you're growing. You ought to start recognizing that there's some things about you that you no longer need or prefer or even like. And so you ought to have the freedom to discard that and go on to what you like now. Now, if there's somebody that's in your life who's trying to always meet that right there, and, and if it's about that person, then they can never be settled. They can't grow themselves because they're too busy trying to meet your blueprint. Too, 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 too busy trying to, to, to live in your fickleness, and we all are fickle. We'll change them. We will change on you. So the best thing God says, I got a solution for you. I'm going to make you one. I got a solution for you. I'm going to make sure you're not double minded. I'm, I got a solution for you. I'm going to make sure you don't have to show up with a mask on. I got a solution for you. You get to be yourself regardless of the crowd you're in front of. He said, come be righteous. That's the best version of you. Get this. Even if the people don't yet realize that. Because even when you show up as your best self, everybody won't be in agreement with it. Because some people benefited from you being scattered. A lot of people benefited from you being the old person. That's why they were even willing to be in relationship with you. That was something that they got out of it and oftentimes left you empty. God is saying, we're going to change the game for you. I'm going to put you in a position where you can feel whole. You can be clear. No longer scattered, no longer double-minded. He is one person you need to be. And guess this, when you deal when you deal with that, guess what you learn how to say? No. Guess what else you learn how to say? Yes. You know what to say no to. You know what to say yes to. And with that comes peace of mind. I'm kind of get ahead of myself. All right. So I want you to be righteous now. How do I show love? I'm going to show you how you connect the two. Let's connect the dots. 
love. Well, let me back up. I jumped ahead of something. This love thing, what kind of love we're talking about? This is this is talking about agape love. Agape love is that benevolent love. It's not a love of your emotions. It's not a love that gives you butterflies. It's a love that comes directly out of your will. If you remember, your soul is made up of three parts. Tripartite. That's what tripartite means. We, we, we are tripartite just like God. God is three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are three in our makeup because he made us like him. And so we in our soul, we are three. We also soul. We also three in body, soul and spirit. But also in your soul, there's three compartments. There's your mind, your will and your emotions. Most of us think that love has to always be an emotional thing. This that this what God is asking for uh, in terms of agape love is not an emotional love. It is a love that comes from your will. Your will is your place where you have made up my mind. I have made a decision. And here's the decision that you have to make because it's a benevolent love. That means I'm determined to be benevolent towards you on or, or more simple, simple terms. I am determined to do good by you. Determined to do good by who? Everybody. That's why in scripture, when God says, love your enemies and it makes you kind of roll your eyes, we can take the eye rolling out because we normally roll our eyes at that because like, I don't even like my enemies. I don't love them. They don't love me because we think it has to be an emotional feeling. God is saying, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to, to decide I'm going to treat people right no matter how they act. And if you pause with that, you know what God is doing? He's handing you self-control. You're not going to let anybody else dictate how you act. You're not going to mimic bad behavior because bad behavior showed up in your life. You're not going to tear down yourself to meet somebody else's reaction. You're going to take care of yourself. You're going to guard your heart. You're going to take care of the quality of your soul because whenever we reduce ourselves and perform poorly, or have some malicious uh, behavior, that stuff has to flow through us first. And God said, listen, I want to give you self-control. Your behavior is not going to be a reaction to somebody else's. You're going to do good. You're going to do right by them. Okay, God, how do I do right by everybody, including my enemies, including strangers, and especially those people that I say that I love emotionally? He says, show up as your best self. That's how we get back to righteousness. I jumped ahead a little bit. I'm going to be me wherever I go. I'm going to be the person God called me to be. That's going to be my conversation. That's going to be all of that. That's what I'm about. And he said, that's how you demonstrate love. And get this. When I act like that, it puts God on the hook. As I told you in the beginning, God now becomes obligated to bless me. So that and let's stop. Let's 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 become very clear right there. God becomes responsibility to be the source of my blessings. How does that benefit you? One of the things we have to be delivered from in order to begin to walk into this life is what I've alluded to so much, and that is our addiction to people pleasing. Or in other words, I'm moved by how people respond to me because quietly I'm performing for them in hopes of getting something back from them. So I made them my source. So I conduct myself in a way that seems to be most pleasing, least offensive, whatever it is, so that I can get some affection back, get some attention back, get something that I believe that I need. God says, I'm going to deliver you from that, too, with righteousness. He says this, I'm going to be a source. Now, granted, sometimes you can pour into people and be a blessing to people and they, and they bless you back. That's wonderful. But God is saying from this point on, you don't have to be obsessed by that. You're going to get the blessing. You just may not know where it's coming from, but God says he's still the one that's responsible for giving seed to the sower. So with my righteousness, I am becoming a sower. I want to pour the best parts of me into anybody that, that God gives me as an assignment. I'm going to bless you with the better parts of me. And I also can say, God, you got to bless me back because if you're going to use me, you got to replenish me. And so God is responsible for that. 
And so I'm no longer trying to please people to the point where I know they'll like me enough to give me stuff back. No, I'm going to be me. And God's responsible for me. That's one of the major benefits of this. No more performing. I just show up as me and see who wants it. See, this understanding has, has, has not only helped me to show up and be at peace with myself and not have the jitters and stuff like I used to, like I got to walk into a room and perform and be like everybody else. No, that part is that, 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 that part is absolutely wonderful. But it also helps me to be okay um, with who doesn't want me. I, I don't obsess over that. I don't, I, I don't obsess over rejection anymore because I only want to be in crowds and in spaces that want what I have to offer. I don't want to force me on no one. I believe that everybody, God is somehow trying to get what everybody needs. He's trying to get it to them. And if I'm not what they need, I'm okay with that. Does that make sense? It's just a shift in perspective. It's just a shift in perspective. And so this combination of love and righteousness also, we, we, we've gotten over the fact that we're people pleasing. That's huge. But hit, but the thing that we all uh, trip over is this next thing, that the combination of righteousness and love helps us to defeat. And that's that word fear. Fear is the main culprit in you not getting your life. And God hates fear. He hates fear so much. He, he said this about fear over in Revelations 21, verse 7 through 8. He says this, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. Overcome what? Fear. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars to have their part in the lake, which burn it with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That was a horrible list of things. But the, the, he starts the list out with the fearful. He's saying fear is the forerunner. Because it is fear at the root of us becoming all these other things, the, the liars and the whoremongers and uh, being abominable. Uh, being unbelieving. Fear is the catalyst behind all of that. And God says, we got to deal with this fear because this fear is keeping you away from him. And so he tells us in our main text, 1 John 4 and 18, the power of, of this, this agape love mixed with righteousness. And he says, there is no fear in love. He said, if, I, if you can get in love or get in the state of mind where I know I'm going to do right by people, then there's no room for fear. See, fear only creeps in if I'm performing, trying to figure out, am I going to be enough? That's, the, that's, the, that's it right there. Am I going to be good enough? Am I going to be enough? If, if that's taken off the table, what does fear have to, to tease me with? Nothing. I just show up as me. And, and if they don't want me, it's OK. Because God has promised me that there is a there, there is a field for my seed. There, there is a harvest waiting on me. And I want to get to the people who want me and not waste a whole lot of time with the people who don't need what I have right now. See, that's a different perspective. That it's not so much they don't want you. I just don't need what you have right now. And that's OK, y'all. So this, they're, they're, fear doesn't live in this place. And so that's why if we can live in this state of love, fear starts to be inched out because you become good with you. Because you now know I'm good with God. And it goes on to say, because this perfect love cast out fear. You need to see the picture that is painted right there. This perfect love. It doesn't mean it's flawless. Perfect in this text means mature. Mature means I have, I have reasonable expectations out of life. I'm mature. I know what I'm responsible for. One thing I'm not responsible for is your reaction to me. What I am responsible for is my response to you. And so when I walk maturely in this life, putting away childish things, 
and becoming the man that God called me to be, righteousness, then that mindset cast out fear. That word cast means to grab something and throw it and not even care where it lands. Why? Because it has no value anymore. Right now, fear has too much value in your life. Fear has too much significance in your life. God said, it's telling me you, if you get these two things down, you get to the point where fear don't matter. You can just toss it away. It doesn't matter at all. And he goes on to tell you why. Because I've been alluding to this. He says, because fear involves punishment. You think you're going to get punished because you're not enough. You think you're going to get punished because you don't measure up the people's changing preferences. Now it's not even about your preference anymore. It's about me pleasing God and blessing you. Major shift in perspective. Because for the most part, it's been about pleasing people. God says, please me. And you'll be able to bless them. How do I please you, God? By obeying my commandments, by being who I called you to be. Then you will be a blessing to the people. Blessing, a source of instruction, a source of impartation, a source of inspiration, an example for them to look upon, for the right people to look upon, for the people that are assigned to you to look upon. You'll be a blessing to them, but you'll be concerned about pleasing God. That's more important to me because God is not like man. He says there's no variableness in me. There's no changing in me. God's not changing every other week because he's complete. Man is growing, so he should be changing. God is whole already. He's, he's not changing. And so once he tells you what he wants, you can take that to the bank. I'd rather be trying to please somebody whose preference doesn't shift. Makes sense, doesn't it? And he says, those who are fearful uh, have not been perfected in love. You haven't grown up into this love. This love of God who says, love me. How do I love you, God? By being who I called you to be. And go love them. How do I love them? By being who I called you to be. He said, if you're still afraid, it's because you hadn't grown up in this yet. You're not mature in this yet. But if you get mature in this love and righteousness thing, fear is going to have a hard time getting to you. Am I making sense? All right. 32 minutes and 23 seconds. Let's do the takeaway. All right. Takeaway said this from Sunday. Uh, righteousness is healing me while guiding me into the life I dreamed of having. I am becoming a person that God can freely use uh, to receive his blessings and to be a blessing. I'm becoming somebody that God has no problem with blessing because I'm mature enough now to be a blessing. Righteousness and love coming together to making us whole people. I hope you understood that. I'll be checking out the chat to see if y'all understood it. If you if you if it blessed you, I hope you put some hearts in there so that we can move up the algorithm. Uh, if you if you had faith that it was gonna bless you before we got started tonight, I hope you already forwarded it, uh, just shared it with somebody else, shared it to your timeline. Thank you so much for that. But listen, I spoke to a crowd of people before uh, we really got started, and I said there's gonna be some people tonight that God's gonna pull into this thing who have not accepted Christ yet. I want to talk to you. It's time. You understood what I just taught. I know you did. You should want that life, and I believe you do. But the only way to walk into it is you got to accept Jesus as your Lord and admit I need to be rescued. So if, if that's you, come on, pray with me right now. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I confess in my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible tells me that because of that confession and that admission of faith, it makes me two things, righteous and saved. Lord, I believe the door is now open for me to become who I ought to be. Lord, I believe I have been saved from the penalty of my sins. Lord, I believe I belong to you now. Holy Spirit, come live inside of me. Teach me all things. Show me who I am. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you said that prayer with me? Reach out to a brother. Let's talk a little bit. I want to answer your questions. 
You can hit me up at info at we are C-Y-M, W-E-A-R-E-C-Y-M dot org. Would love to chat with you. No, really, would love to chat with you. So reach out and, and, and we'll reach back out to you. OK. All right, guys. Uh, sewing time. I've sewn into you. Hopefully you think it was good enough for you to sew back into our ministry. We have several ways for you to do that. Uh, we have the Givelify app. We're out there on the app. Go look us up. Uh, we have a uh, cash app, and that is dollar sign we are C Y M again W E A R E C Y M we are C Y M. Uh, our website is we are C Y M dot org forward slash give. Take you right to the giving part. If you're on Facebook tonight, there's a donate button down on the right side of the screen. You can click on that. I always want to give a shout out to our folks who are watching us faithfully over there on YouTube. Thank you all so much. Please go ahead and like it over there as well. And also share it. Take that clip and share it to somebody you love. Share it with somebody you want to walk into the future with so that you can be on the same mindset because two can't walk together except they be agreed. All right. Going to let you go for this evening. Thank you for giving me part of your Wednesday night. I hope you felt like it was a worthwhile investment every time. All right. Till next time. Much love. <laughs>